Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to the Real Quick with Mike Swick podcast, special quarantine series number eight. Eight. Today we have a special guest from Australia, a new location that we can talk about the quarantine, the coronavirus, how he's dealing with it in that area. Um, he is a legend of the sport of Muay Thai. He has accomplished everything that you can accomplish. He is one of the most famous foreigners to ever go to Thailand and live, train, and go through the ranks to become champion in, in, in multiple different organizations and, and weight classes. He's a living legend of the sport. I'm talking about John Wayne Parr. All right, John Wayne Parr, welcome to the show. You, thank you, thank you for the opportunity to have a chat. Sawadee Cap. Hey, Sawadee. Sawadee, Sawadee, Sabadi Mai. Oh, uh, took one. I'm almost, Sawadee took one. I'm almost at my yeah. limit, dude. That's, <laughs> that's all, we're yeah. almost at my Thai limit. Cowpad guy, Mile Gatiem, Mile Pig Thai. That's it. That's Ooh. yeah. Wait, hang on, hang on, there, do. Yeah. What Sing about this? Sing deal to your cater, Jack. Bye. Sing deal to your cater, Jay. Turn Sing deal to your cater, kid. Do. Hey, Lou. Go on, kid. Go on to Jack Chan. Bye. Yeah, that's what you need to do. You need to get up to date, mate, so you can start singing these songs. Yeah, the song <laughs> words, yeah, bro. Um, oh my god, yeah, wow, that's <laughs> the Thai songs are the greatest. Um, yeah, yeah, man, that's crazy. Um, so yeah, when I because when I was bored, um, uh, there was no Westerners where I lived. So the past time, I was like, oh man, hey, what can I do? So I go and buy the latest uh, album and I put it in and I press play and press stop and then I write down in English all the words. And then I just play it and just just read it like karaoke, like a karaoke thing, um, but with the English sort of Thai version. And then I just try and memorize it. And then you go to the live bars and do um to karaoke, and then and then try and rip rip one out in front of every, all the Thais. It used to be so much fun, um, just watch them freak out and go, "Holy crap!" The white guys singing our songs, and uh, they start dancing. And uh, even if I got only got like eighty <laughs> percent right, Lisa so, like partying and stuff. It used to be so much fun. It used to be so cool. You must have been awesome to hang out with, dude. It sucks we missed time frames. Yeah. Like, I think you went to you went to yeah, Thailand. Yeah. You went to Thailand in what, like ninety six or something? Yeah, ninety six. I moved. I moved. I moved. I was in uh, Pattaya for three months, and then I moved to uh, uh, Nonthaburi in uh, Bangkok, That's and then uh, I stayed there uh, for another three years, and then I moved to the country in Batum Thani uh, for another year again. Uh, so that, that was hectic. Being in the country sucked because uh, there's nothing to do but Muay Thai. Uh, but when I was in the city, Lisa, the shops only like down the road. If you need something to eat, there's only walking distance, and it, it was way more better. Um, when, when, when we lived in Bangkok, uh, so every morning and every afternoon, we'd do a, like a kilometer run down the main busy road, and then there'd be a, a crazy asylum where it was all gated, so only people that could work inside the uh, industrial area where they had a, they had all these different buildings, like a, the, the building of um, – uh, 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 cancer research and all these sort of different places, and all it was all parklands and waterfalls and fountains. And um, every, you'd see the maybe three, four other gyms around the area that used to use the same paths. So, um, even um, there was a famous uh, boxer at the time called uh, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, oh, I just had a memory blank, not not Samson, the, uh, the other one. Well, anyway, um, we used to see him running all the time, and then he'd run up to us, have a chat. And then he go, all right, got to go, guys. And then he just take off. Like, and we're, we're running pretty fast. And he was just making us look like we we're standing on the spot. Yeah. I was like, holy crap. Uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah. So he was a WBC world champ. And um, I, and just, uh, yeah, it was just cool. Being in Bangkok was really cool because everyone was, uh, uh, if you want to go to Tulumpini, you jump on a ferry for half an hour. Uh, um, and, yeah, it was just it was just better. It was really – it was amazing. It was so much – and especially when you're the only white guy too. Yeah. So you stand out like like, like dog's balls. And, and everyone just looks at you like you're some sort of alien. <laughs> so, so that used to be the fun part as well. It was just like uh, – and then as soon as you start speaking Thai to them, they're like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> and you go, you yeah. can talk. It's like, I know. <laughs> That's crazy, yeah, bro. Yeah, and, like, I, I did the complete <laughs> opposite of you. Like, I, I came in in, like, 99 – and I started in Bangkok, and I was at uh, Rompo Gym in Bangkok off Rama Row Four, and then I moved from oh, Rompo with with Aslan. I think and, so. Uh, and then Jern Peck was the main guy. Jern Peck and Lek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then I, I trained uh, with those guys, and then I moved from there to Patea. So I, I did the opposite of you, and then I went to Sitfulek in Patea, and I trained at Sitfulek okay, yep, for yep. three months with actually Ching Pek, Ching Pek, uh, Kiatsun Grits. Yep. A very famous. Uh, uh, one very, lot, was one lot there? Probably. Uh, was one lap the shorter guy? 
Uh, he's about my size. I fought him. Um, he was pretty famous. One look was famous at the time. I don't know the name, but uh, there was a few, he, few he, guys he was, there. Chang he was Park their was biggest there. star in the gym. Yeah, I haven't been to the for like in so. Sure. Yeah, that was this was in '99, uh, 2000. So I haven't been back there since. I ran into the yep. guy, the, the Dutch guy that owns Sitfilek a, a while back at, a, at another event for the first time in like 10 years. I saw him and I was like, yo, I have a gym here now. It's crazy, you know, like how things work out, you know, because I was like this is a little guy, this little white guy with, uh-huh. with my friend training at Sitfilek and training with Cheng Puek and all these guys. And Cheng Puek, you know, for people that don't know, it was a legend in MMA back in the day. I mean, he fought Ernesto Hoost in the, in the finals of K2. Uh, he was in, he was the only Thai guy in the K1 series. Like he was like 185 yeah. pound Thai guy and and just had brutal leg kicks. Like, uh, but could drink and smoke like no other man. Back when I like when I was training with him, it was like straight from training. Of course, he was like after his prime, you know. But it was like straight from training. I'm all gung ho, like hungry young kid, and he's just demolishing the pads and training hard. And then yeah. like right after that, it's like straight to like playing pools, drinking beer, and smoking cigarettes. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. Um, it's crazy. Do, do you remember his fight against uh, Rick Rufus? Yeah, he broke his uh, he broke Rufus's leg, right? I, I'm not sure if he broke his leg. I know he stopped or... him with um, leg kicks. That was the first time America really uh, had the first taste of leg kicks. And all that before, was all above the waist before then. And then uh, that was the first time where it's like, and then um, uh, Duke Rufus is famous for the interview. Uh, anyone can throw a leg kick. It takes skill to kick to the body. Anyone can kick the leg. It's yeah, sort of yeah. cheating. Uh, and then yeah, and then but now Duke's like a hundred percent Muay Thai now. But back in the day, it was like a big culture shock. Right? Like, what's this like? Kick, what's this like kick business? Yeah, it's but, crazy. Yeah, like uh, I Chang think Ho, I heard Chang Ho, Chang Ho, he was a the, the giant killer fighting yeah. with a banner and fighting all those massive big guys. guys, giving away all that weight, weight and height, and, and doing well, holding yeah. his own. Yeah, so, I was, yeah, was starstruck. That goes, man. goes to show you the size of his heart. Yeah, he he was a, he yeah he had a heart of a champion, and uh, yeah, and then like I I had heard he broke. Uh, Rufus's leg or fractured or something. I don't know for sure, but I I heard that he broke 13 legs in his career, like 13 leg bones in his, in his whole career. Of course, that spans like, what, 300, 400 fights or something. So I believe that. I don't know for sure if it was Ruf- Rufus or not. Um, I believe he fought Rufus for a couple of times. I'm not, not sure, but I think it was, one of them was in America. Again, not sure about that. Um, but yeah, he's had amazing fights. And Esther Hoost uh, fought K1 multiple times. And I remember when I got to the camp, I was in I was in Rompo Gym in Bangkok, and one of the, some of the guys came through and said that there was a gym in Patea. Come check it out if you want. And I was all like, Nah. And my, I was funny because my friend was like, Man, you know, let's go down to Patea and check out this gym, man. It sounds like a good gym. And I'm like, no, nah, bro. I was like, I gave him the whole speech. I was like a kid, you know. I gave him the whole speech. I was like, no, nah, bro. You gotta be loyal, man. You gotta be loyal to your gym, yeah. you know. Like Rumpo took us in. Like, you know, we, we, I forgot if we paid or not. I think we definitely gave them back money. I don't know what what the situation was back at that time, but uh, uh, I remember we we definitely were. Uh, that was our first gym that because I'd went to a lot of gyms, man. I, I had no direction, so I showed up in Thailand. And I was like, like taking taxis to random gyms just to try to find a gym. I had nobody to give me direction. And I found this Rompo gym. And I was like, all right. So we took like a weekend break, went to uh, Sitfilek, went to Patea. And it was like Chang Puek there. And Chang Puek, shockingly enough, was on the video game. Like, like back then, you, they had like the PlayStation like 1 or something. It was like the very first one that ever came out. And you could buy the PlayStation and then like 300 bootleg games or something for like you know, yeah. hundred bucks or something, whatever it was. And so we were playing like this, the PlayStation in the room and it was a lot of like these Japanese games and like foreign games that like weren't even available in America. And one of them was like a, a K1 game. And I was always chain quick because he had the leg kicks. And I could, and then I, you know, I was that guy that knew like one kick, but could win every yeah. time because I would use that same kick. So we got to Patea or Patea and went to Sitfilek and I saw a chain quick and I was like, Oh my God, dude, this is a legend of the sport. We could train with this guy. So we went back to to Bangkok, and I told Jeremy Pack the situation, and I was like, "Man, can we go down there and train for a little bit?" He's like, "Yeah, yeah, sure." I mean, he didn't, he wasn't trying to build some huge fight team at the time or anything, and of course, we definitely weren't part of a fight team at that time anyway. Uh, and so he was cool with it, and I was like, "Boom, let's do it!" And we went down to sit for like for a while, and I remember just going on runs with him, and people were like honking the horns, and like, you know, he had a lot of respect in Patea, like just 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 from oh, his fighting yeah, and yeah. stuff. So. It was cool, man. That was that was a good time. So again, that was like ninety nine. So long ago. The, man. the owner the owner's name's Frank. Frank. Frank Superleg. The the there chubby guy. Frank Superleg. The chubby yeah, yeah, guy. Yeah. 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 Yep. Very. And he looks the same. So, uh, I saw him like ten years ago. So you want so you want to hear a funny story? Yeah. Of course you do. Of course you do. I've so got, uh, <laughs> of um, course. I was supposed to fight Chung Perk. I was supposed to fight Chung Perk in uh in America on a Dennis Warner show. 
And then I was living with Angie at the time. It was in New, Me- New Mexico. Uh, and then, so training up, training up. This is going to be a hard fight. And, and then uh, a week before the fight, um, I get a phone call from Dennis saying, oh, bad news. Chung Per uh, can't get his visa. Uh, for some reason, uh, something happened, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we're going to, tr- we're doing our best. He rings me a, a day or so later. He goes, oh, uh, unfortunately, we, we rang Johnson. Un- um, Johnson un- doesn't want to fight yet because because uh, of the weight uh, difference. Uh, he thinks you're going to be a little bit too big. Uh, I think the fight was at 70. Uh, he was fighting 67 or something. Um, so he said, oh, no worries. I, I don't really want to fight Johnson either, but if I had to, I would have, but um, I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> and then uh, and he said, and then they said, oh, we've got you an opponent. Um, I'll let you know who it is when you get here. Oh, so me, me and Angie, me, Angie and um, uh, Melchor Manor, we flew to um, New Mexico. And then um, uh, Dennis takes me up to his bedroom. He goes, all right, so I've got you an opponent. Um, and, uh, his name's uh, Baxter Humpy. Uh, he's, he's the only one in the fight show. So he's really good. The only thing is he's only got one arm. And I said, what? Oh. He said, yeah, yeah. He, he, uh, he fights. He's had like 50, 60, 70 fights. But he's, he, he puts a stump, uh, a glove on his stump and, then, and they tape it on. Um, so it will be like a modified tie, no, no elbows. Ah, well, yeah, you know. Um, <laughs> um, so, so yeah, not fighting a guy with one arm. It was crazy. It was a really good fight. It was, um, uh, yeah, he, he's a, he's a legend. I, I, I won and then, um, he went on to win a couple more uh, belts and stuff. He was, he was crazy. Wow. But the idea of fighting a guy with one arm from That's going from Chum to a one arm guy, I was like, what's going on? It was crazy. It was so crazy. But, um, yeah, he's super cool. It was, it was a really, it was a really cool experience. That's crazy, man. That is so crazy. Yeah. 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 For, yeah and yeah. then uh, the, the, the bad part was when you fight a guy with one arm, no matter what you do, you lose. So every time I threw him down the clinch, the crowd would boo me. Or every time yeah. I, I I did something really good, the crowd would boo me again. Yeah. I was like, what's going on? You're supposed I'm to get beat up in this fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. And then, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was a crazy, if, if you, if you, if you win, you lose. And then if you lose, you lose. So yeah, I was like, oh, far out. This is, this is a tough situation to be in. You did it, though, man. I mean, that, is, that is a tough tough uh, pressure to have. You remember Tepeset Stadium in Patea? Yes. Yeah, so I was supposed to fight in Tepeset. That was my, my big fight, my first big fight where I was supposed to have. <clears throat> and uh, and Chang Puck was there for me in that fight. And then, like, uh, wrapped my hands, got me all ready. And I was ready to go. Like, I did the whole, like, you know, you know before you, you go to a fight – the worst part is until the fight. Once you have the fight, everything's out the window. You're just fighting. It's like another day. You know, maybe the nerves, maybe the excitement, maybe the, you know, the unknown, the prepping, the getting ready, the hoping you did everything correctly, getting your hands wrapped, getting everything done, your, your warm up. All that's the most vital part. So I did all that to get ready for this big fight at Tempest Stadium. And Chang Prick was wrapping my hands. It was like a dream situation, you know, my first like stadium kind of fight, you know, even though it's Tepeset, Tepeset was good, but, you know, it wasn't obviously Lumpini, Raj Modern, but, um, and then my opponent backed out. He never showed up. He didn't never, he never came. And I was like, I was so sad. I was like a sad puppy dog, dude, because I didn't get to fight. It was some Uh, Thai guy that like probably was like, you know, older and like, you know, kind of like past his prime, but it still was like, oh man, that was my big, uh, my big stadium tie fight that I never got to have. Which was may have been good. Uh, <laughs> I didn't have a real Thai style, you know. I was like more of a a brawler kind of uh, puncher. But um, that's crazy, man. That's crazy. You know these guys. And like, uh, I ran into Frank, and uh, I was I was in uh, Syphilic with Fairtex. Fairtex was doing a show Max uh, Muay Thai a while back. And after the show, I ran into yeah. Frank. Now I hadn't seen Frank since 2000, 2000, 1999. And I was like training at his gym and had that big fight coming up. And my friend actually fought that night in Tepeset uh, and won via decision because of just punching. He was a, he just outboxed the tie. His leg was injured, um, and the tie could never get anything off. Um, so uh, you know, we trained there for a long time. Had a kind of a nice little history together. We were, there weren't many foreigners at the gym at that time. It was like me and my friend, and like that's it. And then it was like you know te- you know Ching Puek and and I forgot the guy's name. There was a shorter guy, and then a couple other guys. Um, and I ran into Frank, like, you know, with uh, after this Max Muay Thai fight, and he had no idea who I was. But I was I wanted to kind of, like, it was reminiscent when I saw him. So I was like, wow, man, that's when I started. That's when I was coming as a kid to Thailand. And I just had these dreams of, like, being a fighter and using Muay Thai to help me with my fighting. And I was just going to these gyms. And, and you know, he took me in there at, at Sitfalek, and I trained. And it was cool. 
And I was like, yo, I'm that kid that was there. Remember 20 years ago? You know, like, of course, he was just like, oh, yeah, okay. You know, that's cool, man. Yeah. Yeah, he was just being real nice, you know. Uh, but he had no idea. But I wanted to be like, yeah, I have a gym now in Thailand. And, like, I've came back. And I'm kind of I'm giving back, you know, and having, like, you know, I, I never the culture never left. And I'm back here again living and all that. But it didn't It didn't really. It wasn't like the reunion that I expected. But yeah. he's a busy guy, I guess. Yeah, and no, I, I was lucky to be adopted by the family. So uh, it wasn't so commercial, so it was, it was very more intimate. So yeah, just the more more one on one is because uh, on the sort of commercial gym, you see someone for two weeks, three weeks, they disappear, next one comes in. Whereas with us, it was just that pure three or four three or four fighters, and that was it. Yeah. So yeah, it's easy it's e easy to get a bond then. Yeah. Um, yeah, and especially when you're like I said, the only white guy too. So I remember all our dishes used to be crazy. And the Thais just look at me and go, oh, if there's uh, five dishes, they go, this one, mm, this one, uh, this one, uh, maybe. So, and then I kind of barely eat the food and then um, slowly, slowly start adjusting and get the, start killing the taste buds. So, um, you, you have to soon adjust to eating fire and lava yeah, yeah. just to get by. Yeah. So, yeah, there, there was, um, yeah, so, so different. So, um. Uh, Especially when you start living like them too, because uh, there's no furniture, so we'd all have to sleep on the sleep on the floor. Um, we'd eat on the floor. Uh, yeah, even just chilling out was sitting on the floor, and um, yeah, very very old school. Yeah, but it was good motivation to be to to reach greatness because you you don't want to be poor anymore. Or right, I'm gonna do what I can. I'm gonna fight my way out of this from nothing to something. I want to be something. So, um, yeah, and then uh, it's, it, it doesn't happen. It takes a while. Yeah. yeah. But as long as you're committed, it, it, it eventually happens. You just got to keep committed. But, um, yeah, just uh, it, it definitely makes you humble for sure when you're living like just uh, pure basics, just just one pillow, one blanket, one cup, one plate, one spoon and fork, uh, and just training. Just everything relies on time. being better than you were yesterday. So, yeah, hectic. Um, and then you, it's a man, you must win the whole the whole yep. camp uh, relies on your payments so the more you win the more your payment goes up so there's so much pressure to be to be great um, yeah I think my, I'm not sure if I mentioned last time when, when I was in the camp uh, uh, we had like, there's about maybe eight guys in the camp and then um, I had a fight came back and then everyone ran away so there was only uh, me um, Sankta Noi who was the killer at the time um, and the pad holders in the family. So, and then uh, Sankta needed a, a, someone to clinch and she needed someone to boxing spa. And I was the only guy in the camp. So I was like, holy shit, I, I gotta, I gotta step up. And, um, and then like he's getting ready for Deckers. So I gotta imitate Deckers for Sankta Noi to get, to get ready for him. And that's a hard situation too, because when they fight, you with Team Sankta, it's like, fuck, that's Decker. And it's like, fuck, I don't know who to do. It's crazy. It's, um, so, so, uh, the same when he fought Danny Bill as well. Um, being there at the weigh-in and being with Team Sangtan and seeing the whole controversies. Um, so when when uh, Sangtan fought Danny Bill the second time, I think Danny Bill was over about 10 kilos. Uh, and he said, oh, I'll tell you what i do. I'll give you 30,000 baht if I don't have to make weight. And Song Chai said to Sangtan, all right, what do you want to do? So I said, yeah, 30,000, that's heaps. Yeah, I'll take the 30 grand, uh, 30,000 baht. Had the fight. Um, Danny was way too big, just kicked the uh, shit out of Sangtan's legs. Uh, Sangtan went the distance, but... Um, but yeah, agony. Had to use a walking stick for about a month after his leg was smashed. Yeah. And then uh, Song Chai was so disappointed with Sang Ten's performance, he, he didn't give him the 30,000 baht on top. Oh, so wow. he did all that for free. Yeah, amazing Thailand. <laughs> what, what was what was 30,000 yeah, baht but, worth back then? US dollar or, oh, or, that or been, Australian that, dollar? That, uh, that would have been uh, 1,500 Australian. So probably 1,000 American back then, I guess. Oh, wow. But still, that's a, that's a lot of, lot of money in Thailand. Thirty thousand—that's yeah. um, a it's, it's, couple it's, months' wage. Oh, for sure, that's a lot. That's, that's the same now. It's uh, yes, yeah, thirty-two to one on the dollar right now. So, that's crazy, man. Do you remember these? Oh yeah, of course. The, of course, the, the I, I lived on those things. Red Bull, I, like yeah. in the bottle, dude. Yeah. Ah, so I strong. Drink it's it, like, uh, it's like syrupy, like a like yeah. like cough syrup, bro. So much like bad shit is probably in this. It's like. If you if you yeah. do the American version, I don't know about in Australia, but do they have these in Australia, or is it just the canned version? Uh, just the carbonated one. At the Asian shops, you can get them. Um, if you go to Thai this Town is... or a uh, little um, uh, Chinatown, um, they have, sell them there. Uh, yeah, it's um. All right, have you ever done the big night out with uh, soda, whiskey, and Red Bull? Yeah, 
Yeah, had a few. Yeah, of yeah, that's a good night. That that's a good night then. That's real Red and Bull, man. That's more, so strong. So, so as you, the more the more you get drunk, the more you're getting energy from the Red Bull. Yeah. So it's like a yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's almost like a drug because it's the, the energy of that Red Bull is like ten times the energy of a can Red Bull. Like you taste a can and it's yeah. like wow, this is like water. You know when you when you put in this, yeah. one of these in your mouth. Um, so what was a typical day? Let's yeah, real quick it, before we get to uh, the- if, if, if when you're doing the syrup, if your eye doesn't twitch, it's not strong enough. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know you're taking some serious stuff when it tastes like medicine, but still it's really good too. It's the same at the same time. It's like addictive. Um, so what was a typical day like for you when you first got there? You were in Bang you were in Patea then went to Bangkok, but what was the training yeah, like? Bangkok. A typical day like uh you'd wake up cuz I remember like I would train so yeah. much that like the bottom of my feet like in in Rompo gym in Bangkok, the 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 flooring of the gym didn't have the mats like we have now. It was like more oh, rugs, like those little like rugs on top of concrete. And so we would yeah. kick so much that the bottom of our feet would just get like completely like all the skin torn off of it. And I remember yeah. I'd be in so much pain from like the training, the clinch work and, and the my feet that I would like wake up in the morning. And then like when I hit my alarm, I would like take some Tylenol or something like just to like just to get like <laughs> my body where it wasn't like aching so much. And then I'd go down to train and we train like two times a day. Um, and sometimes the run and all that. What, what was it like for you? Like when, when you trained there, what, what what was it like? And then how was it different than when you were in Australia before you went there? Yeah. Uh, so uh, in the mornings in Thailand, I think we'd, we'd hit the road, hit the road by on the road by six. We'd do an hour run, uh, come back, and then there's another uh, two hours in the morning. So usually just three rounds on pads, uh, bag rounds, uh uh, your, 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 your chin ups, your push ups, everything else. Uh, not too bad, not too hectic. The boss isn't awake. Um, you go through the motion. Every now and again, he'll wake up. When he wakes up, then you have to put in a big session. Uh, try super, super hard. But if he wasn't there, just cruise. Uh, and then in, uh, have, bref- uh, have a shower, have breakfast, have a sleep for a few hours. Um, and in the afternoon, we start again about three. We'd run uh, just for about 45 minutes. Uh, we'd do our shadow, uh, do maybe. 15, 20, 25 rounds in the bag until you get called up for pads. And then, um, so when it was close to fight time, I uh, would do, we do five, five minute rounds on the tie pads. Um, and then three rounds on the, on the focus mitts. But with our tie pads, we'd have to go, um, 10, 10 at the start. Mm-hmm. And then it was 10, 10 in the middle, 10, 10 wow. in the middle as well. And then 10, 10 last 30 seconds. So yeah. three sets of 10, 10s yeah. in, in five minute rounds. And then, uh, every kick had to be a double. So every, when you weren't doing wow. your 10 10s, you weren't allowed to throw singles. Every kick had to be a double. Um, yeah. And yeah, and then every and then every day you're expected to train harder than yesterday. Yeah. It was like course. fuck. Even the shadow boxing. Um, all right, just get just focus. Go go go. It's not a warm up. It's a it's a pretend fight. Yeah. So and then we just hit the the oh, so um so with my camp, my gym owner had had one leg. Um yeah, uh, Mr. Bruno Mumut Bobut. Yeah, uh, yeah, he was super famous. Uh, he had uh, three Rising Number Champions and uh, one I, uh, IBF um, World Boxing Champion, all training with one leg. Um, yeah, it was crazy. Uh, so he used to sit on the ends of the ring and show us stuff with his hands. Like right, this was a T, this is a round kick, um, elbows. Like, this is your punches. And then uh, when we would, sometimes when we would fight, he uh, he wouldn't be right in the corner, but we'd look over and we could see his hand signals just like we would in training. Yeah. And then you know you straight away what to do. Um, yeah, it was so it was so crazy. So yeah, so sorry, I get off track. Um, so mornings was three hours, afternoons was three and a half hours, um, and then afternoons was so intense. Um, uh, yeah, everything had to be a hundred percent go go go. And then uh, like I was saying before, there was no one else to clinch uh, Sanctan besides me. So um, and then when you you're clinching the, the he was the guy at the time too. Just every thirty seconds, every forty five seconds. And then eventually I'd last a minute and then a minute and a half and then slowly I get the two minutes. And then it made me really strong, really fast because I had to get better. And um, the worst part with uh, ties, they don't tell you what you're doing wrong. They just throw you in the ground, stand over the top of you, wait for you to stand back up, clinch up again, throw you in the ground yeah. again. And it's like, I'm not learning. This is sucks. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you learn by yourself. You learn where to put the feet. You learn your body weight. You learn to adjust. You learn where to, how to lock, lock the hands different ways. Um, yeah, and then so the fun part was so after three hours, three and a half in the afternoon, our main trainer, um, the 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 owner of the camp, son, 
would have dinner. He'd start hitting the whiskies. And then once he got wasted, and then we used to play spa on, on the tiles in his um, lounge room. Um, we pushed, we'd push the one or two couches out of the way. And then, uh, yeah, we'd, we'd, have, we'd be dripping sweat on tiles, um, just, uh, uh, just tippy-tapping. Um, for hours, the more I got drunk, the more we'd play. And um, it was, I think that's where I learned most of my stuff. I had to get um, good with balance and good with uh, getting – not having to think about the checks, just having the checks automatic. So, yeah, that, that really helped a lot. Um, we, he used to call himself the drunken master. Nice. And it was so much fun. It was so cool. It's a different culture, so you, man. Yeah, you kill yourself, kill yourself during, the, during the day and then and then just play at night. And then, um, yeah, it was, it was just uh, – it was. It didn't seem like a job. It was too much fun. It was just fun to just play. So yeah, that's when that's when I was just um, obsessed with the sport. I mean, obviously, you're one of the most decorated champions of all time. That's that's a foreigner in Muay Thai. Um, at what point? It was, come on, stop, dude. At what point? Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> more, more. Keep going. Uh, at what? At what time? <laughs> at what time during your training? Um, when you first went there, obviously you you had been in like Taekwondo and stuff. I think when you were younger, right? Like you you were in yes. like, you were in Taekwondo before, right? Before you got into Muay Thai. Yeah, I, I when I was eleven, I started Taekwondo for about a year and a half. Uh, so I did that, and then um, the Taekwondo uh, closed. Uh, they couldn't make the rent anymore. There was only like a half a dozen of us training, so they they stopped. And then um, about six months later, kickboxing came to the same hall that the Taekwondo was training at. So um, I thought I was I was obsessed with Taekwondo too. Yeah. So I'll do this kickboxing tour. I'll find another Taekwondo school. And then I, st- I did my first class and I was like, oh man, how good is this? Yeah. This is crazy. You know, I had a punch to the head. Yeah. Um, there was, yeah, they had uh, the unit, instead of having the proper gi, it was like uh, long karate yeah. pants and uh, the muscle singlets. Yeah. I was like, this is amazing. This is so cool. So uh, yeah, my obsession went from, from Taekwondo to, to kickboxing. And then uh and then uh, the the like uh, the movie Kickboxer came out, and then yeah, the fascination of this crazy mystical place with um, all they do is train and fight, and um, it's like this is the perfect place for me. This sounds like a uh, heaven. Uh, if this is their national sport, I don't want to play football or cricket. I'd rather just punch on all the time. That'd be way bench, mate, way more fun. Um, so yeah, so then and then uh, I had thirteen fights when I was um, coming up the ranks. Uh, so I won an Aussie title. I won a South Pacific title. So when I went to Thailand as a 19-year-old kid, I thought, oh, I've had 13 fights. I'm the man. I've got a couple of belts. Wait till the Thais um, get a load of me. And then I got there. And then uh, I remember sparring some 12-year-old kid. And he just threw me around like I was just nothing. And I was like, I got humbled very fast. Yeah. I was like, oh, whatever I thought I knew, I know nothing. These guys are killers. And then, then you go to Lumpini and you see them, the Thais fight for the first time. I think, how am I supposed to fight these guys? These guys, there's no pain. Look, these, this guy's bleeding and he's calling the other guy on like a freaking madman. What's yeah. wrong with that guy? <laughs> and then uh, and then all of a sudden you start playing in the st- in, in the little stadiums and then, um, yeah, I, I don't know if you see my post the other day, but the opportunity, to, uh, my first fight for Song Chui, um, Danny Boone rocked up and then um, I got thrown on the card on, on 24 hours notice and uh, my first fight, Song Chui fight was in front of 40,000 people uh, in a park um, in the middle of nowhere. Everyone was just... Yeah, it was, and then had to get a, a police escort from the from the little tent to the to the ring, trying to work our way through the crowd to get to get to the corner, uh, and just like, you so this is this is insane, and then and then to win, it's like holy shit! All the tires come up there, and they all want to touch you and feel yeah, you. Yeah. They, they can't believe you, you. They can't believe you won either. Yeah. It's like who are you? So I'm from Australia, and they're like Australia. You guys do you you even do Muay Thai? I was like, oh, I, I guess I, I guess I'm the guy. I guess we do. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it was fasc- it was fascinating that no one no one knew Australia did it. And then uh, and then I got uh, the everyone gave me the dangerous kangaroo, uh, Jinjo Mahagan. Yeah, I was uh, I was um, yeah, no one was a dangerous kangaroo for it uh, for after that. So yeah, it was amazing. It was so cool. Um, yeah, and then fighting and uh, so I had a two. Yeah, first fight was in front of 40,000. And then the second fight was um, I, I, I fought his boss. So the guy that I fought um, was by pure fluke. And then the the, uh, the trainer was so upset that he lost. He goes, I can't believe he lost that guy. That one was nothing. I, I would have smashed him. And then Song Chai heard him and he said, oh, do you want to fight him? Um, I can organize it if you want. He goes, yeah, I want to teach that for longer lesson. So next minute, this guy hadn't fought for three years and he came out of retirement. 
Um, and then uh, it was booked for like six weeks later. And then all the magazines and all the type papers, uh, Rakan Winslin's coming out of retirement to fight the dangerous kangaroo. And I was like, oh, no. Was like, I didn't know how big this guy was. This sucks. Uh, and his fight name was uh, Break Out of Hell with Punches. Um, uh, 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 um, yeah, Matna uh, So, uh, so yeah, I learned the Thai guard very fast. All right, he's very famous for his punches. So you want to try and um, lock your wrist out as much as you can. I don't know if you can see it on the camera. Yeah, so yeah. instead of being here, if you get hit, you can hit yourself. Yeah. See if you can lock yeah, your like wrist it. and just hide behind that, hide behind that guard. And then, um, yeah, as long as you keep your chin safe, you you should be okay. So yeah, we went out there, obfuscated the game, and this time was in front of uh, eighty thousand people. Uh, so I've gone from 40,000. Oh, yeah. And then next one's like, holy shit, where's all these people coming from? This is freaking crazy. And then um, I wasn't I wasn't uh, going in there as the favorite either. I was going to supposed to get smashed. And then, uh, yeah, I was lucky to stop him in the, in the third round. It, it was so cool. Crazy. Just Again, silence. E- everyone's supposed to be going, woo, and they're all like, Poof. yeah. And like, you know you're done well when there's, when there's no crowd. And it's like, yes. Um, yeah, and then uh, I think I had, Next fight was uh, Lumpini. So, yeah, some try goes, oh, you've done really well. Um, I went, next fight's uh, Lumpini. So, rock up. And then uh, I don't, back in the old days, I don't know if they still do it now, but when you fight at the stadium, uh, you have to weigh in naked. So, yeah, they've got the, the, the pen there. And then once you, before you get to the pen, you got to drop your undies and walk in there. And it, it's funny when you're the Westerner, all the ties do the old yeah, around the corner yeah. to see it, see if the rumors are true or not. <laughs> and unfortunately, I, unfortunately, I don't do us for long any justice. Oh, they go, ah, no. oh, he's he's smaller, he's smaller than we are. <laughs> oh my god, dude! Come on. <laughs> dude, so- uh, I, and the, you, you can't blame it's cold either because Thailand's hot. Yeah, yeah. It's like damn <laughs> yeah, it, you're, you're, screwed, man. you're screwed on that one. So, so you're someone when you, when you got humbled um, when you first. Uh, trained in thailand so you can imagine obviously i came with no title so how you, you can imagine how humbled i got uh, obviously but obviously you had a great start um i mean th- that was a great start but what at what point were you uh w- when did you see yourself being what you became or possibly becoming what you became like like what part of training or fighting in thailand uh where you started saying okay Okay, I'm gonna be one of the greats. I'm gonna be one of the guys to fight and and be one of the best Western fighters ever of all time. Uh, I I told myself that when I was four. Uh, I knew when I was four years old, my destiny was to be the greatest, one of the greatest. Um, and I, I've never swayed from it the whole time. So no matter what happened in my life, um, I I, uh, I lived on on country farms growing up, so I never had the opportunity to train at any specific gym or martial art. Um, but I was just fascinated with that. I'd rent all the movies. I'd rent. I'd watch all the martial arts. I'd watch, watch the the Bruce Lees and the Jackie Chan's. It's like, ah, I've got to train. I've got to learn. How am I going to be a champion if I don't have a gym to train at? And then I eventually moved to, to the city when I was eleven, and then then I started the the adventure. But uh, I, I always knew deep down that um, uh, my my destiny, my destiny was the to, to, and I, I told myself, no work. Uh, I seeing other people. Um, you, they'd, they'd train for a bit and then uh, there's either the wife would come in and she, or the girlfriend or the job or you got to move or something happened or an injury and they'd be gone and um, my theory was I'm not going to get sidetracked I, I, I want to be the great I want to be great and the only way to do that is to stay the course and, and don't get distracted what, no matter what life throws at me i I, I got to reach my destination I don't want to be that guy in 20 years time and think oh, what if if I didn't get the job and had accepted what I was doing, if I had a, I could have been somebody. I don't want to be. I don't want to be that guy. I heard that too many times. Uh, I could have been this. I could have been that. No, I don't, I'm gonna do it. Uh, I, I'm not stopping until I do. And I'm still going. And I'm still trying. And I still want to try and go higher and higher and higher. Um, that's the only thing that drives me is to be keep climbing every step. Every fight's another step up the up the Mount Everest. Yeah, Same. that's yeah. awesome, man. That's so cool, ah, yeah. dude. I just for the first time got to actually call the fights at uh, Raja Demnern. So Raja Demnern and, and Lumpini obviously are the two most famous Thai stadiums in the in the world. Um, I I think Raja Demnern is one of the most famous combat sports arenas ever in the history of our generation. I mean, like like more fights have happened there. I mean, you can say like in America, for instance, like Madison Square Garden and Vegas has these epic fights or whatever. But they're not fight stadiums that have only fights. You know what I mean? Like, like Raja yeah. Damnar is such yeah. a like historic place where I used to go watch fights, and like that was where the best of the best. Lumpini, the same thing. Um, 
And I just recently got to go with Absolute Muay Thai and, and uh, Absolute Muay Thai is on Fight Pass. And so I got to actually go and call the fights and, and actually commentate the fights at Roger Damner and like, you know, 20 years later. And that was incredible, man. That was that was a really cool experience for me just for like, you know, this kid coming in 20 years ago to now having a gym here and then going and actually calling the fights and like, you know, doing the broadcast and stuff. I was, I was excited about that, man. Um, but yeah, it's, it's so many memories of going and watching those fights at the stadiums when I was coming up and like just sometimes I would because I'd say I was on such a budget in Thailand because I, I would stay there for periods of like two and three months at a time to train. So I'd be on a budget. I remember the budget was like $20 a day or something like that. I forgot what it was, but I'd divide it up and, and like how much, you know, and I'd spend how much on food and this, that, and the other. And I tried to be under budget so that by the weekend time I could have like, you know, do more things and like enjoy more things. And, and one of those things would be go to the stadiums like Roger Modern or Lumpini, buy a ticket, go in there by myself. And I'd watch the fights and, and just be like, wow, it's crazy. You know, it's just until you go to one of those stadiums, uh, and see a fight for the people that are watching, uh, you haven't really experienced the fullest like extent of like, just, just, just br like, it's hard to explain just, but, but the real rawness of fighting and like the culture and the, and you, and you fought in Lumpini obviously, and you fought in Raja Damnern too, as well. You fought in all of them. Yes. That's crazy, man. It's, it's so crazy. Yeah. And, and we were there at the same time. It would have been crazy to see you fight, you know, like ha had I, uh, uh, in 99, 2000 time frame. But uh, that's it's so crazy. Yeah. Man. People don't realize like how how huge that is for you and your career of what you've accomplished and what you've done. Me being yeah. here, having a gym, yeah. and like seeing how it's ran here for the last ten years, and like going through the whole the business side, but also building this gym and seeing all the fighters and hiring fighters and trainers and all this type of stuff. Uh, man, the respect's only grown for people towards people like you. You know, that came here and like you came. You were one of the first to come here and kind of like live and train and just be such a legend man so hats off to you much respect yeah. much respect for that for sure uh so i got the opportunity that my first fight at little penny uh, i was aged uh, 20 years old uh i had my i was 19 i was fighting in the small stadiums and then uh my i think my seventh eighth uh seventh my seventh seventh i won uh fourth round knockout my first fight at Lumpini. and then uh my second fight at Lumpini was um Five days, I don't, you probably heard this story before. Um, five days after my uh, 21st birthday. So, yeah, my birthday was on the 25th of May, and then I was fighting Lumpini on the 30th of May. Wow. So, I remember having to uh, train, train, hit the pads, go for the run, uh, have to do the sweatsuit, the whole business. It was so shit. And then every, everyone thinks you're 21st, you're going to get, uh, have the biggest party ever. And um, I'm just thinking to myself, oh, and oh, yeah. So, uh, uh, when you fight on at Lumpini, uh, and if you win by a knockout, um, they give you a gold chain. So I remember laying in bed going, "Oh, it's my 21st. This sucks. Um, I got to knock this guy out. I got to, I got to give myself this birthday present. I want to get, I want that chain for my, for my present." And um, I remember getting to the stadium, and then uh, it was another uh, Muslim guy. So I fought the other guy first, and then I fought the trainer, and this was the third Muslim guy that they wanted to steal revenge for. Um, and it's like, oh. And then I heard rumors that his train, his friend, his trainer's friends were tra friends with my trainer. Like, oh, he's shitting his pants. He doesn't want to fight you. He was crying in the lead up to the fight. He doesn't want to be here. I'm like, really? Oh shit! So um, first round, I've gone out there all confident. And I started landing, started landing, and then uh, I seen, I, I heard him, and then I uh, ended up stopping him uh, round two. And then I uh, yes, I got the gold chain. Got to give myself a 21st birthday present. Nice. And then um, uh, uh, oh, it gets better. So on the way to the on the way back to the camp, everyone's yelling at me. I'm getting destroyed. They're going, what's wrong with you? Well, um, why'd you knock him out for? Couldn't you hear us screaming? Young, young, not yet, not yet. What are you doing? I was like, what, what? And then, um, yeah, we didn't get the bet. We didn't get the bet any money. Uh, yeah, it's um, it was a waste of time. We, we could have won so much money if you just had to play the game and knock him out in the third or fourth once we got our money down. But you went out there and had to beat him straight away. And now, um, and now it sucks for us. Yeah. So, oh, but it's my birthday. The whole I wanted to win at Lumpini, and I just, all I got was got yelled at all the way back to the camp. Wow. I was like, oh, fuck, this sucks. Um, yeah, ties are ties are brutal. Um, if you don't play the game, they are they're very unforgiving. Yeah, yeah. it's a gambling sport, man. Yeah, yeah, they they are. And no matter what, every time I won, I still get abused on the way home for something. I don't know what I done. Uh, I remember at 99 King's birthday had the. 
had the greatest um that was the first time i won on the king's birthday and everything just one of those ones where everything was perfect i sort of had a six cent every time i did something i was checking and countering and um just everything was landing my only injury after the fight was um bruised knuckles from punching his face <laughs> and then um yeah just uh get back to the camp and same things like that was I don't know why you're trying to show up out there. Um, you didn't impress me. Uh, I don't know why you just didn't knuckle down and try and try and stay to the game. But you want to try and do all the all the showboating. I say yeah, but I was trying to entertain as well. I was trying to like have 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 fun as well. Ah, oh, then that this this is we don't fight like that. And I say oh man, yeah, it just sucks. It just no matter what you do, you you're always in trouble. It sucks. Yeah. Well, you handled it well, man. Yeah. And you kept winning. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Every. I, 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 I sort of kept going in this um this sort of circle where I I I, I never know when my next fight was going to be. So you train for a few weeks and it's like oh this and every day like I said you got to be better than yesterday. So you're just exhausted every single day, and then uh, you're just thinking oh I don't know if I can do this anymore. I think I'm done. I think this is going to be my last one. So I go in there and then the opportunity to fight say Lumpini or a King's Birthday or, or a TV show, and then um and then you win. The next minute you're in the magazines again and you're on TV yeah, on TV. It's oh, that's amazing. And then you get that fire again. Yeah. And it's like, when's my next one? You start training. And it's like, oh, this sucks. I want to go home. And then it's just this this circle of, oh, it's just, it's so awesome, but so hard. And so, uh, yeah, it's just this, it, it, I love it so much, but you hate it, but you love it. It's one of those ones where you're sort of stuck. <laughs> yeah. But if you want to be great, if you want to be great, you got to stick the course. You can't come home otherwise. You, um, yeah, you, then you lose. So yeah, if you need your focus, you got to. No matter how exhausted you are, um, for that 10, 20 years of commitment, and then you got uh, sixty years of freedom. So I don't, I don't have to work anymore. I can just teach people at the gym. I can just relax. I don't have to worry about having a boss. Yeah. It's, uh, it was so worth it. Hey, what's up, guys? Sorry about the break, but I got to thank our sponsor, AK Thailand. Whether you're a fighter looking to get uh, into the Muay Thai world or to improve your MMA skills with Muay Thai. Uh, you know, guys like John Wayne Parr and myself have been coming here for 20 years to learn these techniques. Um, or you're just somebody that wants to get a good experience training with uh, world champion Muay Thai fighters, training with third degree black belts, training with world class MMA fighters, uh, doing strength and conditioning, yoga. We have a restaurant. Uh, we have a perfect setup, a perfect location in the jungle where you have this this amazing Thailand feel while you're training. Uh, when you're training Muay Thai, you look into the jungle and you see the the mountains and the jungle and the winds blowing and the oxygen is coming straight from the source. Um, it's an amazing experience. I'm not just being biased. I built this gym for a reason to be the perfect gym, and I think we're on our way, definitely. Um, but anyway... Uh, I know you're stir crazy right now. I know you're going through quarantine and there's, we're getting a lot of messages that people want to come and, and come train after this quarantine's over with and you can get out of your house and 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 have a little bit of freedom. I'm going to make that easier for you. The 30% special is still going on right now. It will be going on uh, throughout this podcast uh, until the next podcast for sure. Um, so if you go to akthailand.com, we will save you 30% on your booking for any time in the future. So this will be the best deal we ever do. Um, so take advantage of it. Um, and it's 30% off all group training classes, be it Muay Thai, uh, MMA, BJJ, strength and conditioning, yoga, or all-inclusive packages where it includes all of them in one package. You can book a week, you can book two weeks, you can book three weeks, you can book a month, three months, six months, a year, whatever you wanna book, it's 30% off. Again, the best deal you're gonna have. Uh, AKThailand.com, the pricing page is already set up. All you gotta do is go there, book, and it's done. Um, you can use this package anytime in the future, so don't worry about the quarantine lasting uh, too long and you can't use it, or maybe your country, even after the quarantine's over, isn't allowing travel for a certain period of time. No problem. You can wait and use it at any time in the future, one year, two years, three years, four years, whenever you want. Um, when you book the training, you just email us at info at akthailand.com. We send you a confirmation, which you'll get when you book it. We put you in our POS and you're set. So you can use it any time in the future. You can also, which 
no other gym does here, you can transfer this training. So if you do end up booking the training at a 30% discount because you want to take advantage of the special, but you can't come in the future, maybe you decide you don't want to come to Thailand or you don't want to train, you can transfer that to somebody else. You can give it to a friend, you can give it to a family member, somebody that else, somebody else that wants to come, or you can buy it for somebody else. So if you want to purchase the training now at 30%, save the money, and you want to give it to somebody else, like maybe your son or your friend or your brother or a present, whatever you want to do, you can do that. Just let us know. We change the name. And whoever it is that's going to come, they can just show up, give their name in the, in the showroom at the check-in, and they have their training package. So, again, that's akthailand.com. You can email info at akthailand.com. Yeah. So And, and it's not over, man. So uh, you retired at, at the end of last year, I think. You, you fought a couple times with Bellator. You fought in Ryzen. Then you retired, um, yes. and now I just hear you signed with One FC, and they're look. Are you still looking for an opponent yeah, my, for One FC? My last fight was a, a ten round boxing fight against uh, Anthony Mundine here in Australia. Yeah, so, which I won on, on on points, which is really cool because he's a man. He, he in, in Australia, Anthony Mundine's our, our Conor McGregor. Yeah, wait, he's he's the money guy. When did you have that fight? So yeah, uh, November thirty. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that was right. Okay, November thirty. Yeah, yeah. Ten, ten, ten rounds boxing. And then, um, so yeah, it was a really, really entertaining fight. I was really happy with that. Um, I could have done, I was so fit, I could have done another 10 rounds. Uh, I was really surprised at uh, how, uh, I, I went and did a fitness test before um, to get my uh, boxing license. And uh, when they did my um, pulse, I, I had a, I was um, a 40, 42. Oh, wow. Um, a resting heart, rate, resting heart rate of 42, at 43 good. years old. That's good. I was like, holy shit, that's great. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing, I was doing something right, obviously. Um, yeah, and, like, and then during the fight, I I put the, uh, I knew that I couldn't beat him on the outside playing his game. I had to just pressure, pressure, pressure. Um, so the first round, second round, and, it, and everyone was watching. It's going, oh, he's going to gas out for sure. And I wasn't sure if I was or not either. I just had to uh, trust in my um, abilities. And luckily, luckily, I got to the tenth round, and I, and I was punching to the final bell, which um, um, which is really cool. So I was happy with that. And then yeah, I was pretty much done. I, I uh, I've had a few injuries with my hip. And then uh, it got to the stage where ever just walking, standing, sleeping is just agony. Um, and then February, I took my uh, one of my students, Lockie, to Singapore to fight for one for the first time. Got to meet everybody and all the staff and the promotion, and everyone was so welcoming and friendly and professional. And then uh, I, I met the the promoter Yod Choi, and he is such a he was such a legend. He was so welcoming, uh, and and he he's, he's like oh I. I I'd love to have you to come back for and fight for us. Um, I've been a fan for years. I love your aggression. I love your boxing, um, uh, your entertainment. Uh, and then they threw a contract at me that uh, pretty much doubled Bellator. I was like, holy shit, how am I supposed to say no to this? Yeah, of course. So, yeah, it was, um, it was uh, definitely a good arm twister. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not used to tapping, but it's like, all right, sure, I'll yeah. come back, whatever. <laughs> yeah. I hear you, so, though, yeah, man. I'm very, it's a fight, very, it's a very, very happy. I'm so, so excited. And then the day that I pretty much the day that I signed the contract, the virus started. I was like, no, yeah. not now. We can't have a world epidemic now. I need to go and fight. <laughs> yeah. So, so your hip's okay now and like it, it's better for this? Uh, uh, I mean, I know no. hips are important yeah. for fighting, especially but, uh, for you. I, Can you fight through it for this, for yeah. these fights? Yeah, uh, I'm I'm currently seeking treatment, and then in Australia they can't do elective surgery right now because of the government shutdown. Yeah. So uh, once that gets back on back on board, hopefully uh, I can get a quick fix. Uh, I talked to the surgeon already, and he said there's about a two month recovery period, and after that you can get back to training. So um, yeah, I, I, there's a called uh, a Birmingham resurface. Uh, a lot of fighters like uh, a King Mo apparently has it done, and uh, the gentleman that I fought boxing, Anthony Mundine, he had the same one done as well, uh, and. Uh, I'm not sure there's a few other fighters out there that, that have had it. Um, uh, oh, what's his name? Oh, anyway, um, yeah. So hopefully, hopefully it's not too restricted for the kicking and kneeing and everything else, and still can carry on. Like a, uh, I don't know exactly if I'll be exactly the same, but at the same time, I'm willing to, to change uh, and tweak my own style. So I'm more probably boxing leg kick instead of um, relying on my left kick as much. So, um, yeah, just have to be uh, more aggressive with the hands, I guess. Yeah, so this, this sets up a very interesting probability. Um, I think you're very familiar with this guy, but it, I think Yatsen Klai is still with 1FC. And this is a man who's Ooh, yeah. one of the most famous Thai fighters of all time. And you fought him three times, correct? Yeah, And the times. last time you won, was it the yeah. last fight that you won? 
Yes. So last time we, yeah, it was I would uh, have split, to, points, I, split points. Very. I would have to say that the, say, <laughs> there's a high probability that this fight is where they're aiming. What What do you think about uh, a fight with Yachts and Clyde now, and and how do you think how do you think that would go at where y'all are at in y'all's careers? Yeah, uh, yeah. The 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 so many champions. Um, I'm not sure if Cosmo Alexander is still fighting at 77, uh, but I know that Nikki Nikki Holson's there. Uh, I know. Uh, I think I'm not sure if God's still fighting 77 or 70 anymore. Um, but if the opportunity comes to fight him again, the idea of fighting Yotsin Gwei in MMA gloves sounds uh, a little painful. <laughs> but I, I definitely admit they could it could be a rough night at the office that way. But um, I'll have a crack. Uh, the only way to become awesome is uh, to fight these guys. Uh, the more you can talk about it, but uh, unless you get in there and do it, uh, you gotta you got to prove your worth. You can't just pretend to be a champ. you gotta, you got to show it. So whoever they give me, I'm happy to fight. And especially the amount of money they're giving me too. Uh, I'll fight Godzilla for, for what I'm getting paid. So yeah, why not? I mean, of course, the health is number one, man. you got to have your health. And uh, you know, money is obviously a huge issue with fighters. And, and that's a reason a lot of fighters take these fights. And, and, and obviously a Yasin Kai fight, if he would make the same weight as you would be a tough tough fight um but but how is your health and 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 how are you're 43 how, how is your health yes. at 43 like how do you feel i mean are you are you fully capable of fighting in a in a, in a good state you think oh yeah for sure um no even even with my hip at the moment i, I can push through um yeah, it's a uh, painful but at the same time the 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 sacrifice is, is worth the pain um the 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 the, yeah, um, yeah. I'm not disabled. <laughs> yeah. So, and I still got the hunger. I still want to be great. I, I still, I, I don't want to. I'm not just doing it for money. I'll, I still want to win. I still want to make a name and um, uh, prove my worth to the to the uh, the one audience and, and show that I deserve to be amongst these other greats. So, um, yeah, just because I'm older doesn't mean that I, I haven't lost my my drive. Um, and then once all this craziness is over and we can get back to business. Um, the the excitement of having a, a date so it, all right here oh, we're going to look for may 20th for instance and then you got something to wake up in the morning right. and, and and achieve um yeah i don't want to be that guy that oh, every even now even though there's no fighting or training or anything around i still wake up at five it's still the best time of the day to wake up and watch the sunrise and have a coffee and uh just be you, you, like yourself you're a, you're a dracula you know yeah, about you, it you text me the other so, night i go to bed at five <laughs> I am so off That's schedule right. right now, man. I'm on like American time. I'm like, I'm staying up late doing work and emails and stuff. And like, yeah, I, I'm, I, I text you at like 5.30 a.m. my time or something two nights ago or something like that. Yeah, like, yeah, like, I'm, what, I'm up all night, What the man. hell are you doing up? <laughs> Getting up for this interview at like 10 a.m. Or I got up at 8 a.m. That was like crazy early. I got yeah. like four hours of sleep. <laughs> for me, normally, that'd be a normal Ooh. time to get up. But since this quarantine, yeah. I've just been so off schedule, man. I've, I've been staying up so late getting so much done because i mean when you're stuck inside of a, a house and you can only leave you know to get essentials and stuff you know or, or just to go you know and, and just get out of the house for maybe a little bit of time you lose track of days you lose track of time it's just like you're just stuck in the house oh, all day i'm doing podcasts and i'm up you know i'm watching a lot of videos and stuff like uh, self-help videos on like uh, business and and catching up on some good podcasts and uh, you know, working on the gym stuff and, and things like that. But yeah, it's just, it's my time frame's all off, man. Um, so, 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 about so where this... I, live, I, I live in a place called the Gold Coast here in Australia. And uh, it's on, on the beach. It's uh, one of our, our number one tourist uh, our capitals in Australia. And then, uh, so we had this headland that we run around uh, twice a day in the morning and night. And then uh, in, in the mornings, like sometimes you see the sun come up over the ocean and it's really popular for surfers as well. So as you're coming around, uh, you're equal with the guys that are catching the wave. So as you're running back, you're you you can sort of watch the guys surf the wave at the same time as you're running around. Yeah. It's um and then uh, uh one morning I even got to meet uh Kelly Slater. Oh wow. Uh, he was at the top of the headland watching the surf. And as I'm coming up the 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 headland coming out of the headland, I'm looking at him going, uh Kelly. Yeah. He goes, hey, it's John Wayne. Hey, what are you doing? And the next minute, for the next twenty minutes, he introduced me to all his friends and tells me all these stories and. I was like, holy shit, I can't believe you're Kelly Slater. This is amazing. I heard this is so cool. cool. Um, yeah, it was one of his favorite uh, surf spots as well. So, yeah, we're very lucky to live in our paradise. And then, um, 
Yeah, I don't know. What's the surf like uh, down there where you are? It's not good, man. There, there's mm. one place in, Ty- no, in Phuket no where there's some surfing where people can surf, but it's not it's not very big. But getting back to the craziness, so so obviously this is the quarantine series where we're focused on talking to uh, fight personalities and entertainment personalities in, in the fight and entertainment world about their quarantines. What is it like? Because I'm hearing a lot of like um, – you know, estimated shutdowns in Australia as far as like travel goes. Like they're not letting people travel in and out of Australia till maybe possibly up until uh, September, October, November, December. I don't know exactly which time frame it is. So I'm thinking like Australia is getting beat up too, like America. And I look at the stats before this interview, and I mean we in America have 993,000 cases as of this morning. So that's a lot. We're about to approach a million, and that's 56,000 people we've lost in the last couple months. You know, like over this coronavirus. Um, so I thought Australia was similar to that. And as it turns out, it's not. There's 7,000 cases in Australia. Uh, there's only like 1,000 pending and y'all have lost like 83 people. So y'all are, y'all are not very, uh, affected by this. What, but what is it like for y'all? Like, are y'all under any kind of quarantine and, uh, are y'all wearing masks or y'all not allowed to go out? Or is it just like, like, what is it like there? Yeah. Uh, the masks aren't man- mandatory yet. Uh, they haven't suggested that we do it. Uh, it suggests to stay home. Yeah, you can still go out and get your groceries and stuff, but uh, no, no uh, uh, sitting on the beach or just. Uh, uh, I think from next week they've just re- uh, lifted one of the laws where you can go to the pi- uh, have a picnic on the park now. Okay. Um, but but uh, but only your household. You can't invite another household to come and join you. Or if you do exercise, it's still only two people. Um, we just lost a a, a, a very big personality in the sport of Muay Thai last night, unfortunately. And then uh, even for the funeral, you can only have 10 people. And, it's like, oh. and then he, he's got such a uh, a big profile that they the, probably get a thousand people there and because Crazy. of what's happened. And it's like, oh no, what do you do? This is really sucks. Especially when someone dies, it's like, fuck. Um, yeah, so it's pretty heavy. That that part sucks. But um, yeah, um, and probably New Zealand. New Zealand's probably got uh, even less cases again. I think they might have had only one one or two people die. They're doing, they're doing really well. They're one of the first countries that close the borders. Wow. So, I mean, so it's not, yeah, so the only thing that's changed for you really is the fact that you can't hang out in big groups or they don't want you to, and you're staying home as much as you can, basically, essentially. Yeah. Oh, and, and then four weeks ago, they closed all the gyms. Yeah, so, the gyms. so no, no gyms, no training, no nothing. Buddy, how, uh, how bad does no, that hurt, man? Yeah, like, that, that sucks. sucks. I, I did the same thing with AK Thailand here. They locked up everything and, like, Man, it sucks having. To, I mean, of course, everything sucks. The, the 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 people getting sick and the people dying, and but the the economic disaster too that it's causing with the gyms having to shut and the, and the the concerts and all the people, you know, all the group functions and 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 I guess more intimate uh, events, you know, training and and dancing, well, whatever, you know, like all that stuff is done for a while. Like that's crazy, you know. Um. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm, we're lucky to live on an island. A long way away from everybody. It sucks to travel, but at the same time, when shit goes down like this, it's good to be as farther away as possible. I think it's crazy. Like I'm start. I've had a change of feeling about this so many different times, but I'm starting to feel like um, the fastest way to get over this is almost is the more people that get it, because it seems like in the past with 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 viruses and stuff, the immunity builds up, right? So the more people of the population that get this virus. The, the, the weaker it becomes and the more immunity becomes uh, prevalent. And, and then, you know, all of a sudden this thing doesn't affect you anymore. And I think I've talked to a lot of people about this on my, on my show and just my friends and, and people in general. And so many people, in fact, almost everybody I know either knows somebody or they were sick in January or February themselves. Like they had the same exact symptoms, the same exact sickness, and just nobody knew what it was. So I think, in my opinion, that a lot of people probably have this or have had this and beat it, but it's just it's just like having effects on the weaker people and taking effects on certain people of different demographics, whatever the case. Mostly, obviously, with people with yeah. pre-existing medical conditions and stuff. Um, and nothing further uh, uh, made that more apparent to me than when I looked at the stats of Australia versus America because, like, I mean, like in America, we had, like I told you, 56,000 deaths. And, and of those 56,000, only 100, 120,000 recovered, 56,000 died. So out of the closed cases, the recovery versus death rate was 30%. That means 30% of the people who have caught corona in America in closed cases died. They, their result was death. In Australia, 
83 people died out of uh it was 5500 cases so that's like 1.5 percent or two percent or something like that so then that leads me to believe yeah. that like australia to me you know not just from crocodile dundee but australia to me is like a tough ass place like I mean, you're 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 in a country no. where you guys are like y'all been I y'all think, battle every insect, butterfly, fish, snake, shark, well, uh, bird. Everything kills you in Australia. So like you guys yeah. are just a tough tough culture, you know, like to like deal yeah. with these kind of things. And I think that there's no coincidence here that 1.5 percent fatality rate for you guys can't be a coincidence. And so that that further makes me think that the more people that get this again will will lessen the effects of it and that will be one of the fastest ways of us getting over it versus waiting for a vaccine or a cure that's going to be what 12 to 18 months away from now and what are we going to do just sit in our houses here until then like this is slowing the process down i'm not saying i agree with going out and breaking the 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 stay-at-home rule but i'm just saying i think I think that there's just a lot more people that have it and I think it's going to get weaker and I think that's the fastest way to deal with it. And again, then it comes yeah. if that's the case, who's going to be, you know, the scapegoat, who, who's not the scapegoat, but who's going to be the people that's going to, the volunteers is going to go and get all this coronavirus and millions of people that's going to have to take it to, 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 you know, water it down kind of thing. But kind of America's the answer to that question because it's like they're not listening anyway. Like it seems like I look at the news yeah. and I look at the updates and it's like, they just don't care. Like there's people like getting caught every day in these house parties and like they're covering the beaches and like they're rebelling right now against this thing. So it's like, I don't know, man. I don't know what to think if they're, if they're right or wrong, you know, because like it, it's so weird. It, it, there's so little like known about it. I don't know. I guess time will tell, but what do yeah. you think? Uh, I think the, uh, the American government is imploding within itself with the Democrats and the Republicans yeah. and everyone and Trump. And Trump not accepting that it's a deadly virus, and and telling people if you get it to go to work. And do you remember when he said that? Do you remember when he said tell people to go to work? It's better to be sick at work than a sick at home doing nothing. Oh, I didn't, I like, didn't oh, hear that. No. Wow. Yeah, he, he he went crazy. He goes ah, it's just like the cold. You'll be fine. And he tried to deny it for so long, and I think that's why so many people were infected because uh, he played it off as a joke for so. And then once people started dying, and then then he took it serious, but uh, and then it got out of control. It was too late. Uh, yeah, it's um, it's it's been I've been addicted to watching it because it's like a, it's like um, and then uh, the blame game too. Uh, instead of the one government saying, "Oh, here's all the hospitals here," um, he's got them all bidding against each other to whoever's got the most money can get the most ventilators. It's like, yeah, it's crazy. What's going on? Every, it's 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 an every man for himself situation. Instead of one government is um is so divided. It's it's like oh, you're thinking during a pan. Oh. And then uh, he pulled out of the World Health Organization. He said, oh, no, you, you guys uh, told us a couple, uh, exaggerated the story of how the virus started. So we're pulling 150 million uh, during a pandemic. This is the time that we need him. And he's taking all the yeah. money away. I was like, no. Uh, and then uh, Bill Gates, he's the one that stood up. I, mean, I think he's donating like something, $100 million or something to compensate for what Trump donated. So, And who knows what funny business is going to go on now that with all the uh, vaccines and world population uh and it's like, ah, oh, damn it. This is getting too full on, too scary. Yeah. So, There's yeah, a lot of agendas. We, uh, just, just just, to think six months ago, everything was so easy. And all of a sudden, it's like, what the fuck's going on? This is nuts. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of agendas. Now, I don't believe, I, 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 sorry, sorry, I can't believe no one's written a script about this shit. Because this, if, if you had done this script, um, I, I suppose they've got a couple of movies about it, but um, the, the having the world stop and having no one have an income and, um, everyone stay home. You'd think, oh, as if, as if that would happen ever. And then when it happens, like, no one warned me about this. No one ever told me this was ever, ever could possibly happen. This is fucking insane. Yeah. So yeah, I'm mind blown, just like, like everyone else, I guess. It's it's it, it's like a worst case scenario, you know. And like, it's just so uh, it's so confusing to me, man. And I'm like, I'm not a scientist or a doctor or anything like that. So I just, I jump from conclusion to conclusion, and like. It, it, there's people predicting this five years ago, you know, like, like, is that a coincidence, you know, or not? Uh, now yeah. their situation that's where a, it becomes that, like that's it's a, it's a, that Dr. Dr. Fauci, uh, Dr. Uh, Trump's uh, medical advisor, Dr. Fauci, he, he predicted the five years ago. No, maybe even uh, he said during uh, this is maybe when Trump just got first elected. He said during Trump, Trump's presidency, there's going to be an epidemic of uh, biblical proportions. 
And it's like, oh, yeah, there's a heads up for you. It's like, yeah, the hell did he know that? And then, and then it's happening. It's like, you guys must know something because you can't just look into your crystal ball and have something like that just appear out of randomly. It's like, how, how do you know something like that precise? Yeah. And, you got a four-year four period to get it perfect. Bill Gates did the same thing. I think it was the 2015 TED Talks. Uh, but definitely a speech in 2015. If you search Bill Gates' uh, 2015 yeah. uh, virus, he did the whole thing, man. He said there's going to be a huge epidemic virus that's going to hit, and we're not going to be prepared for it. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of one of these things where it's like, is that a coincidence? Do they know something we don't know? I mean, obviously, there's a ton of conspiracies here, but it's just like it, it's, it's crazy to me like how much this is affecting. And the ironic thing about it um, – is it's it's hurting it's hurting us in a, in a massive way with health and with uh killing off the the older weaker people of the world um but it's also cleaning the world at the same time where pollution and you know global warming all this stuff is like getting better because there's not so many cars on the road the emissions are low the pollution is low it's weird how this whole thing has taken an effect like it's 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 just a weird I don't know. It's it's so crazy to think about. Like like one thing can cause so much, and it's affecting every single career and 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 you know uh, job place. Like I mean, it, everything. Like it's affecting everything. Like uh, so many businesses are shut down. I mean, I would feel like I would be one of the the more you know. I'm in a tourist area, a tourist island. I have a business here that that relies solely on people coming to Thailand to train. And now I have a gym that's sitting closed and you can't even fly here. You're banned to fly yeah, here. Geez. And I'm locked in a, like a, I always call it district because it's not a city, but you know, different areas. Like, uh, I don't know how, to, I don't know how to, uh, I don't know in Bangkok what, what the different areas are, but, um, here you have these small areas that are not like full cities, but they're small little areas. And like, they're locked in, we're locked into those areas. So I'm locked into where my home is and there's a beach and there's this one area and then there's checkpoints covering all the roads so you can't go to from one area to another so i can't go see my friends in in the rawai area and my gym is in the rawai area so i can't go to my gym i can't go to see my friends so oh, man. and i said this oh, in multiple geez, podcasts okay. and it's gonna be a repeat for the people that listen to all of them but so when i do these podcasts i get all these files i put them on a usb stick uh, for my editor for my team my media team and i have to go today now to the checkpoint and meet my media team and give them the uh the usb at the checkpoint they take it then they go back and edit it and they post it by mm -hmm. to, you know whenever so it's it's crazy that that we're in this situation um and and you know i i, I do kind of am starting to feel that the more people that get it the weaker it is because i do feel that a lot of people have had it or have it that it didn't affect and and this is hitting only a certain type of demographic but at the same time i'm being careful as shit too because i'm young i'm healthy and not young but i'm 40 but i'm like i'm younger and i'm healthy i'm training you know i feel good i'm fit i feel strong to to battle something like this but i'm i'm crazy careful man i'm staying in the house i'm like wearing the mask i'm going out like thailand has me paranoid so i'm not trying to get it but I do think that maybe that, you know, eventually the more people that get it, it will start weakening up. And that might be the answer that's going to finally stop this thing, in my opinion, right now. Yeah. It may change the next podcast, yeah. but for right now. Yeah, my, my mom had open heart surgery last year. So she, uh, she had a cow's valve put in. So she, she's accept, susceptible for something like this because um, it attacks all the vital mm -hmm. organs. Um, once your lungs start depriving the rest of the internals for, of oxygen, everything shuts down. Um, so it's not the lungs that affect you, it's all your vitals that close. So, um, and her having the surgery and having so many complications afterwards, um, yeah, she got it. I'm, I, I, and I don't want to lose my mum. So, uh, yeah, no, yeah it's, a, it's very, very it's scary. scary man. Um, as much as, as, as much as everyone would be awesome to have an immune system, um, the ones that do, the ones that we do lose are the ones that, um, are the most precious to us yeah. as well. So it's like, oh, we're in that uh, sort of a paradox where it's like, what do you do? Um, yeah, and I wish I knew the answer. I wish I had a, a, a remedy. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm with uh, you, man. I feel, I feel the same way. It's depressing, man. I think the, 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 the best thing out of this is an, an appreciation of what we have. Um, I'm so happy to have a gym and so happy to have the live the lifestyle that I live. Uh, and when, when we come back, just to be able to go back to it and start getting fit again and start getting back into a routine and um, just, just uh, yeah, we, sometimes it's good to stop the reset, uh, spend time with the family, 
uh, this is what I'm doing everything for. I'm do- I want to make you guys amazing. Um, so and if if I can prove you that I can be amazing, I want, hopefully you can be amazing too. Yeah. So yeah, I, it's just uh, um, yeah. I think that you hear a lot of stuff in the news and the media about domestic violence because everyone's stuck together yeah. for so long. Um, but uh, me and Angie, we've only got stronger. Yeah. Um, I I love the fact that um, she's my soulmate and we live, get to live together. And even before that. Uh, with our lifestyles, um, we've got, we're either at home or at the gym together, so we're together twenty four seven anyway. So, so to be us locked together like this is just um, it's perfect. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't want to be with anyone else either. And then especially in the kids, uh, it's all, almost like a little Thailand. All, all my kids are training and fighting now, whether it be Muay Thai or Jiu Jitsu. So uh, we set the kids upon each other, and then me and Angie have ten baht bets on which kid's going to win. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So what's your <laughs> what's your daily what's your daily life like now like in the quarantine or whatever like like obviously you're not at the gym training and stuff like that like like what is it that you do from morning till night like for you know obviously you're with your family but what do you do for fun like what do you do to kind of get your mind off things and relax and just kind of uh, get get uh, you know take away from this taken away uh, from this this whole this um, whole thing. Yeah, so I'm I'm very lucky that uh, I'm training uh, a husband and wife a, a, a couple a, a couple of hours every morning, five days a week. Um, so they give me enough pocket money to get by during all this craziness where I can't make an income. So at least I've got a little bit of cash flow. Uh, and then during the day, just hang out with family. Uh, I might have a go have a hit in the gym a couple of times a week, just have a sweat um, and get a, a normality. And sometimes you need a sweat. It's good for the soul. So just to get something and get your frustrations out and just uh, feel – even a run, like I was saying before, you run around the headland where I live around the beach, and it's so um, it's so energizing. It just gives you that – that um, just that appreciation of uh, living where I live. Uh, so, yeah, and then, um, yeah, that's, I'm pretty much – even though – uh, the quarantine's like sucks. It's my lifestyle anyway. This is what I do all the time. I, I train. I come home. I sleep. I go back to training. Uh, the only thing I'm not doing now is uh, teaching big classes. But uh, besides that, this is this is like I've been doing this since 1996. So yeah, this is not this is nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's crazy, man. I think like you said, you you nailed it when you said to live after this. Like you know, I think. I think you and I both were not one that needed to be told to go live your life and explore and, and take chances and, and have fun. But I think there's a lot of people that are reserved and you know, whatever happens to you when you die, this is the only earth we're ever going to have in our bodies. You know what I mean? In these bodies. And it's like, see the world, do, do things that, that, that you want to do and, and, and kind of live your dreams. And I think this should be a call for people that once this is over, which it will be, it will be over. Once this is over, it's like take this time now to, to see what life, you know, because there could be something coming in the future worse than this, and it could end travel. You know, it could it, certain countries might be where you can't go to certain countries anymore. You might not be able to go to destinations anymore. It's like while we still can, it's like travel and see the world and do do the things that like, again, I'm, I'm worried that we might not be able to do one day, man. It just, it's just getting to that scary time where you start having to think a little bit that the future doesn't look so bright with everything that's going on. And, you know, man, it's just, we can go on for days about that, but it's just like, I, I have a fear of the future, you know, like what it's going to end up being yeah. as fast as things are happening. I've been, I, I've been petrified of war my, my whole life growing up thinking, Oh no. Was, was, and then uh, they have a, come, a, a germ come in and, and, and infect us. And it's like, I didn't see you coming. That was crazy. You come in, come out from the corner with a sucker punch. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but the whole time I'm thinking, oh, I know the atomic bombs and the whole business. So uh, I don't know. I'm not sure which way I'd rather go out. Um, yeah. Either either way sucks, I guess. Uh, like, I just, yeah. So my theory is um, life's about adventures. Go out and have as many adventures as you can. Um, whether it be uh, like we're lucky to go on flight trips in different countries and go with different fighters and different hotels and different flight nights. Uh, and and uh, live live the dream that way, uh, traveling overseas, la la. But um, yeah, for other people, it's like it's like yeah, you only get you only get one shot at this. Yeah. So um, yeah, get into a routine and 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 to do something you hate. That's um, yeah. That's why I didn't do that. That's why I didn't go down that route. So I didn't have to do that. So uh, yeah, but um, yeah, definitely opportunity to to reset and think. Holy shit. Yeah, we're only here for that this time. Yeah. So I, I went to a funeral once, and um, so the, the the gentleman was explaining you have you have a birth date and you got a death date. Yeah. And he said in the middle you got a dash. So your whole life is that dash, and everything that you've accomplished and every all the relationships 
is there in that dash? And then use the date. So that's it. Yeah. <laughs> that's your memory is that dash. That's crazy, man. That's like so, so crazy. Yeah. But when you think about it, it's so true. Yeah. It, man, it's scary. I don't like to think about all that stuff. But yeah, you're right, man. It's absolutely yeah. so true. So are there any fights going on right now or is it pretty much banned in Australia? Like all fights? Yeah, no, no. We can't even hang out more than two people. Um, so obviously there's no fights being allowed anywhere. There's no sports being allowed anywhere in the world. Um, but Dana White's putting on UFC 249 coming up here on May 9th, I believe it is. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Like, like having a sporting event, probably the only sporting event, of course, it's not going to be an audience, but just having a sporting event on TV, what, what are your thoughts uh, in, in a fighting event nonetheless? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no. Uh, when Lucky fought in Singapore uh, in uh, February, uh, there was no crowd. Uh, there was just the, the uh, promoters, referees, and cameramen, and then, then the fighters, and then the, we're, we're in, in the corners, and then uh, just silence. You could hear every footstep. You could hear them breathing. Uh, it was funny when the uh, the MC read out their names, and then the blue blue corner we got yeah. lucky of them, and, and and all you can hear is me clap. Oh, it was so bizarre! Yeah. It was so it was so weird. So it, we still went out to a billion people on the social media and everything else, but just being there and just having no one there, it's like, oh, this is strange. This is so weird. Um, so uh, the day before we had a dress rehearsal, so everyone had to walk out, find your mark on the spot, da da da. And then day of the fight, we had the real thing, and it was exactly the same as the the uh, rehearsal because there was no one there the same day. It's like <laughs> it was like too too bizarre. Walking down the runway with no no crowd, no one to, no one to clap their hands down as you walk down the runway. Um, yeah, it was it was very weird. So yeah, so Dana White's going to do the same thing with uh, I think no no audience. So it's uh, it's different. It's definitely different. But a fight's a fight. Once you once you get that first punch in the face, you just go into uh, uh, automatic after that. But um, just the uh, yeah, to not have that energy, it's it's a it's an eerie feeling. It's definitely um, something that you never forget. Anyway, yeah, yeah. it's for the fighters. I'm sure it's uh, going to be very peculiar, but very unique. It, we did that on the Ultimate Fighter. That that was a weird thing for me. Like I had fought not in front of, I didn't fight in stadiums before the Ultimate Fighter, but I fought in front of, front of crowds or whatever. And when we got in the Ultimate Fighter, it was the same thing. It was inside a like a like a warehouse and this gym, the, the UFC gym, and it it was such a weird thing walking out. It's like it felt like uh you know you're inside of a gym, they're filming, you're still on this TV show, but you're about to fight like it's a fight. It was yeah. it, it was it dissociated from uh, fighting until you got in there and actually started fighting. It was so weird. Uh, it was a, it was a very different experience, but. Um, as a fighter, do you think that he's doing the right thing as far as like, are, are you, are you supportive of seeing fighters fight and, and possibly being able to fight if other promotions start doing the same thing and they, they, they test all the fighters and make sure that everything's safe or would you rather, uh, just wait till this thing's over with? And because obviously there's, it's not just the fight, it's the training, you know, that you got to train to get to the fight. And that's kind of where the danger is. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Like, I mean, obviously you're going to watch the fight, I assume. Yeah, it's a tough predicament to be in, uh, especially when you can't train to 100% uh, capabilities and with different sparring partners, and especially if you're rolling or whatever else, you can't be sort of in that uh, social distancing when, you, when you're rolling. Um, yeah, that, that makes it quite difficult not to be 100% uh, at, at your capabilities, and you don't want to lose um, because you weren't 100% either. Yeah. That's detrimental to your career. So, yeah, it's a tough predicament to be in. Yeah, um, yeah but um, I'll, I'll watch it. Um, for sure, uh, is it the right thing? Uh, I don't, I don't know, but uh, yeah, um, I, yeah, I'm still watch. But um, I, who, who am I to say if it's right or wrong or not? Yeah, uh, I'm in the same boat, man. You know, it's not, uh, my, it's with, not my decision. With, with America, what's going on in America with Trump letting it, all the countries go back to normal pretty much, and everyone can still congregate and hang out, and uh, it's like it's, they they want business back as usual. The, the pandemic can wait. Uh, people got to make money. So it's like if they, if that's happening, so why can't the fights happen? So, uh, I don't know. I think no the, I, yeah. I think the one thing that'll come out of it for sure. I mean, I, and, and I know Dana's mindset. He's a he's a doer. You know, he's a go 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 go. And if he can do it, he's going to do it. Obviously, he cares about the fighters. He cares about the safety. I'm sure every safety precaution that's possible is going to be taken. Um, I'm like I said, I'm more concerned about the fighters getting ready for the fight than I am the actual fight for sure by far. Um, I think this is going to be a good test for sure. I think this is going to be at least a test 
to show what is going to happen and 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 what 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 the capabilities are and if it it comes off successful and and nobody you know obviously has any kind of problems because of it i think you know it could open the doors for possibly having closed events sporting events um and i think they're planning on more and more um so if if nothing else i think it's going to be a test it's going to it's going to show what can happen and and we'll see and and i think it's going to be one of the most watched sporting events in a long time considering it's the only sporting event that's going to be live on tv yeah. so that that's going to happen so f- for all the people at home that want to ha- that are, f- are sports fanatics and, and mma fanatics and fight fanatics they're going to get their treat as far as that goes so it's interesting and i'm, I'm definitely going to watch it for sure yeah for sure um yeah they sort of they, they they get the highest pay-per-view by default because there's nothing else to watch <laughs> yeah it's crazy man it's crazy so man it was it's so awesome talking to you and uh man we did the podcast before last time and uh we had the picture of you <laughs> with the teddy bear so i promise you we, we record it this time i made i made such a big mistake but uh man it's it's, yeah. it's awesome talking to you man like it, you know the fact that we've sh- shared so much time not shared together but at different times in Pu- in uh thailand and patea and bangkok and stuff like that and, and we've been through so much you obviously being the best and me just being a little kid trying to trying to learn muay thai for mma and and going yeah. through the same thing but it's like we can relate to all that stuff and it's such a good conversation to have with somebody that's been through all that so I always love talking to you, man, and I, and I think you're one of the nicest guys in the in the fighting world, man. I really do, and and I think that that positively, you know, is transparent, and and uh, it, it it just it, it creates a lot of positivity outside of uh, outside of you and 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 this conversation. But uh, I hope the I hope the best for you, and uh, I hope everything works out, and I hope this thing clears up, and you get that fight with one FC, whoever it is. I'll be watching and supporting you for sure. Um, you know, I'm obviously always looking yeah, it's forward. Yeah, very fun. Like, we, we need to get back to normal just so we can uh, start. I, I'm, and then, like you said before, I might be in a, in a predicament where uh, I can't fly anywhere for 12 months either. So I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, did the contract. The contract's amazing. And then not to be able to take advantage of it is like heartbreaking. It's like, oh, no, not now. I get the contract of my life and now I can't fight. It's like, no. Yeah. So maybe maybe this will force me into retirement uh, if I if I if i can't fly anywhere i'm um, everything's overseas so yeah it sucks but um oh well so we'll see what happens well, fingers crossed yeah man i'm hoping i'm hoping like i said for the the improved testing and like they start testing more people that they because right now they're testing people that are like really sick and with pre-existing medical conditions and people that are older obviously they're not testing as many younger healthier people and people that are younger and healthier that are sick are still not getting tested they're going to the hospital and they're like sorry go back home we want to test the people that's actually going to be affected i think a lot of people in our age group and and that are healthy have this antibody in their in their system i think they have caught it and they just are handling it and either recovered from it or are recovering from it i hope that's the case when they start doing wider uh broad testing and and it becomes an issue where it's it's only affecting a smaller tight-knit group and then guys like us who are younger and healthier uh, like the world can can start getting out doing things again and not worrying about it i hope that happens i hope it's not a a quarantine yeah. issue where we're stuck for the next year trying to wait for them to come up with a vaccine that's so i'm hoping that that's the case and i think like i said america is going to be a big test of that because um it should be spreading really fast considering there's so many people that aren't you know kind of rebelling against this quarantine thing so if they if they all are fine th- there's your answer you know like it it, it it you know i don't know it's hard to, it's hard to predict but uh hopefully the best man like i said and and i want to get this thing i want to get the world back and i tell you what you take things for granted and you get complacent with your life and you start realizing the just going to work each day and training and 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 going to the movies and the stores and all the different places the beaches and stuff like when that gets taken away you start really gaining perspective on like uh not being complacent and and i think that's one thing i'm going to take from this where when this thing is over and we're unlocked and we can get out to enjoy life a little bit more and i think other people should do the same and travel and do things and 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 kind of enjoy what we have because man we had a pretty decent life up until this damn quarantine you know oh for sure yeah yeah this is uh, yeah different priorities but now it's, it's good to uh, to reset and, 
And um, yeah, uh, uh, the, the dreams aren't gonna chase themselves. Yep. So if you've got something, go and go and do it because yeah, you don't want to be too old and then have regrets or the what ifs. You don't want the what ifs. Yeah. The what ifs are the, is the enemy. Yeah. You want to make sure that you, when you're laying and you're, um, you're, you're old and you're talking to your grandkids, and uh, just like yeah, I, I I got to accomplish this 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 and this, and they go no way, grandpa. I say, yeah, true story. Look, go through the scrapbook, show them the photos and the and the news clippings. So yeah, you blow their minds that way and uh, become their hero. Yeah, man, I hear you, man. I, I wish the best for you. Great talking to you, man. Always a pleasure, and 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 I, and I wish you the best, you and your family. And we'll have to yeah. do this again once you once you sign for a fight and uh, get ready for uh, your next competition. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, it's gonna be fun. Uh, yeah, thanks again for the opportunity that the chat again. You. Yeah, and stay safe and uh, enjoy some surfing, man, while you can. Enjoy your beaches. Yeah. All right, brother. Hey, Take care. Hey, so what the cups? All right, scab one cup. All right, there we have it, John Wayne Parr. Wow, what an amazing guy. Uh, such a nice guy, man. I can't, I can't express to you enough how nice this guy is. From uh, the times that I've seen him in person, and the times that we've talked, and and getting him on the podcast, and uh, talking through uh, online social media, he, he's just such a nice guy who's so humble to be such a great champion in the sport um multi-time champion in the sport and such a legend it's 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 rare to see a guy so humble um and so nice but it was a great conversation to have i hope you guys got to take something from that i think there was a lot of stuff that we talked about as far as the thailand training and living that that's probably uh you you probably haven't heard before and and i think that's really cool hopefully it resonates with a lot of you that want to come to train um in thailand one day it's a it's a crazy experience and there's nobody that's done it better and at the forefront more than than john wayne parr um so i hope you enjoy the podcast if you did please subscribe if you're watching on youtube subscribe to our channel leave a comment let us know what you think uh, if you're on the audio platforms please subscribe there as well we got itunes spotify stitcher soundcloud um we have a lot of guests coming up. We have some really interesting guests coming up. Look forward to doing the show and, and start putting more of these episodes out for you guys. I think you guys are enjoying them, and I'm enjoying doing them. This is therapy for me to be able to talk to these people from all over the world and friends of mine and and, and, and people in the fighting world that maybe I, I haven't talked to before. So anyway, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Thanks for the feedback, and thanks for the support. Thanks for the support.